Hey guys, Spiritual Warfare, Session 1. Stay tuned. Hey guys, this is Brother Jim. This is covering session one of an eight week course on spiritual warfare. I'm down here by the pond today. We had our first class this past Monday night, the 16th. And there was a number of people because there was some glitch, a glitch on Zoom, wasn't able to get in. And so uh, this is kind of a makeup class. And, but we're gonna be a do, doing a number of things on here. Uh, follow us on YouTube, uh, like and subscribe to the channel. And so let's go ahead and dive in. And this is uh, Spiritual Warfare, session one of the eight week course. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you and we love you today. We ask you to uh, cover this teaching today. God, cover our hearts and our minds and help us to draw closer to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. All right, guys, I'm gonna uh, just go ahead and dive on in. Session one is an overview. It's like the framework. Uh, for the eight week course. And so we, we begin with number one, why the fight? Uh, mankind's first calling in the beginning, uh, mankind's role uh, was to dress and to care for the Garden of Eden while overseeing the things of God. Uh, Eden in, in Hebrew means delight. And so essentially Adam was an extension of God into the earth for the purpose of carrying out the spiritual directives of God while tending to the natural things. Uh, Genesis chapter two, verse 15. He said, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And so the sad familiar story, uh, the deceiving of Eve by the serpent slash spiritual enemy in the garden, uh, the great disobedience of Adam and Eve both forfeiting the great promises and the delight of the close fellowship with their creator. So they severed themselves from God because of disobedience. Watch this. Not only did sin and death enter into the world as a consequence, but Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. A spiritual slash heavenly guard was placed at its entrance, ensuring that they or nobody like them uh, would ever enter back in. Genesis uh, chapter three, verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, to angels, uh, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So they were guarded from ever returning back in because of the broken covenant between God and man. We must understand that in the beginning that God separated the light from the darkness in Genesis 1 and 4, uh, and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. This was in the beginning of creation where he said, and God looked upon uh, the earth and it was void and without form and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God spoke and said, let there be light. When he did that, he then separated the two and because they were not uh, to dwell together, okay? So um, here, uh, man uh, has struggled with this concept since that time, attempting to bring the darkness of sin back into the presence of God. The Father has never stopped loving his creation but has continued to draw his creation back into covenant fellowship. So it's God's desire to pull man back into fellowship with him. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is the struggle all the way through the Old and the New Testament. God calling the man resisting. Uh, the God graciously and sacrificially providing the way back into harmonious relationship or covenant, right? Uh, this is the story of the gospel and could be a complete course within itself. God desires fellowship with man and always has. You know, 
uh, when we look back through our own lives and we see all the times that God has pulled us when we're out in sin, even now when we would move in a sinful direction, the Spirit of God pulls us back to His side. Hallelujah. And so I'm thankful for that. Uh, next, who's the enemy? Uh, what What is this enemy that we're fighting with? Let's look at this. Spiritual warfare is an unseen battle with an unseen enemy on an unseen battlefield. Uh, but it happens in the context of ordinary, real human lives all down through our real human history with very real consequences, wins and losses, agonies and, and victories, griefs and losses. And so uh, let's look at... Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. We're going to be talking about that a good bit through this course. Um, the flesh is our, it's our normal feelings uh and emotions that we have as a human. And a stronghold is anything that pulls us away or holds us back from God. And so uh, in this uh, these sessions of spiritual warfare, we're going to learn how a stronghold becomes a stronghold. And then how do we break that? How do we undo that and get that out of the equation? So... You're going to want to stay with us through all eight of these sessions. Uh, so it's anything that pulls us back away. There is one session dedicated to the battlefield of the mind. And that's coming up. I believe it's our next session uh, that we're going to have this next Monday night. So we're going to be doing some, some natural things. If it sounds like I'm repeating, I am because I want you to get this. We're going to be doing some natural things. Uh, because of the spiritual battle and the way it appears before us in the real world. Ident identifying many of these natural elements will be included in this curriculum. The average Christian has a tendency to gravitate toward the natural uh, fleshly battle. Uh, we see that a lot of times if we're in a struggle with someone, uh, we think that's the, the problem. Uh, but in reality, it's a spirit between us. And yeah, if somebody's swinging a stick at you, they are a problem. But uh, you may take the stick away from them, but there's still a problem. And because there's a spirit that has uh, provoked this person. And so the battle is not between you and I, uh, but the battle is first one in the spirit. And so uh, let's look at this. Um, if at any time we step into the natural and away from godly weapons and defenses uh, we, which we have been given, we will lose ground in our heart and minds as well as in the world around us. Because of the very nature of spiritual warfare means uh, there are both seen and unseen elements in each battle. We'll focus on learning and identifying the spiritual aspect of each. There's no way to fight these battles with natural uh, resources or weapons. However, uh, natural or human things may happen or be undertaken because of the spiritual battle and the way it appears before us in the real world. Identifying many of these natural elements uh, will be included in this curriculum. Uh, the average Christian has a tendency to gravitate toward the natural fleshly battle. It is never who yells the loudest or hits the hardest that guarantees the victory. Remember, this is a spiritual war. We have spiritual weapons, spiritual enemies, and we, the fight takes place on a spiritual battlefield. And so at this point, uh, we'll return to in every session of the curriculum because of the vitality of importance. If at any time we step into the natural and away from the godly weapons and defenses we have been given, we will lose ground in our hearts and minds 
as well in the world around us. And so, you know, we fight with everything that we have to be godly, to continue on a course, but there's an enemy that's against us. And so we're going to learn in this curriculum how to identify that enemy, identify what's going on in the battle around us, identify the powers that's behind that. And so we've got a lot of good ground that we're going to cover in these over the next uh, eight weeks. And so uh, let's look here. An example that highlights this dramatic contrast between the spiritual and the natural modes of fighting we can find in Exodus chapter 17, as God's people look toward uh, the victorious entry into the promised land, the evil one would have uh, rejoiced to see the defeat of God's people redeemed from Egypt, unable to enter the promised land. Amalek was not only opposing uh, power, it was not the only opposing power represented on that battlefield that day. Okay, let's look at uh, Exodus 17, verse 8 through 13. Exodus uh, 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Uh, and Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out uh, men. And go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hands, uh, the, then Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and the one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And so we have the picture here of uh, Joshua is down in, on the battlefield, and Moses is up on the hill. I always like to point out that, you know, a lot of times in Pentecost, we always want to go to the mountain, go to the mountain. Well, Moses was to be on a hill where he could see the battle. He might have even been close enough to hear the cries of the people down there in the battle, to smell the, the smell of the battle, and, and to see the battle. But he was to stay on the hill with his hands in the air. And as he did that, uh, Joshua would con was winning the battle. But if his hands came down, then Amalek would begin to win. And so, so important. I want to point out right here also that Moses was not on the hill by himself. Leaders, listen to me. Uh, don't be afraid to get you some help. Get you some help. I know God's anointed you. He's ordained you and all of these things. But he's also given us enough wisdom to know that he didn't call us to do everything by ourselves. And so delegate, get you some help up there to help you. You may be the one in the position, but you need help keeping your hands in the air. And so we go on here and it says the spiritual uh, and the uh, natural modes of fighting were intertwined, interdependent. Moses stood in the spiritual position and determined the outcome of the battle. Joshua was certainly the one in the natural battle, but he would not have uh, uh, brought the victory home without the efforts of Moses. And so uh, Joshua had to have Moses. And Moses needed Joshua to be down there on the battlefield. So it all worked together. Moses, again, see the picture. Moses had his hands in the air. It brought the supernatural power, transferred it to Joshua. They fought the battle. And uh, as long as, as Moses did his job, the help of God was on Joshua's side. Leaders, get in your place, do your job, and let them fight the battle. Hallelujah. So uh, when, we, when we look at this, uh, we, we see that there are uh, examples in other areas also. Watch this. Over in, uh, in the New Testament, we see a similar event in Acts chapter 16 with Paul and Silas in jail at Philippi. So uh, the, 
they naturally prayed and sang spiritual praises to God at midnight, and God sent an earthquake that shook the jail and freed them from their chains. Hallelujah. Uh, and that happened in Acts 16, verse 25 and 26. 25 says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loose. Wow. Uh, this concept is the springboard for the teaching on spiritual warfare. So you see Paul and Silas, they had cast a, a, a demon out of the woman in the spirit street of Philippi in 16th chapter of Acts. They were beaten, thrown in jail, and uh, the woman was involved in witchcraft. And uh, while they were in jail about midnight, they prayed and sang songs, uh, praise songs, worship songs. And so in doing that, God sent an earthquake. It shook the jail, opened the doors, but it also supernaturally their chains fell off of them blessed be the name of the lord uh, i pointed out a lot of times that the uh the earthquake didn't shake the, uh, the chains of them didn't shake them that hard it opened the doors and but supernaturally those chains were taken off of them glory to god and so uh we'll we will refer to these concepts uh in other uh, sessions of the curriculum also. So what is mankind's role uh, in this now? Uh, the role uh, of spiritually alive mankind, new creations uh, made able and sufficient in Jesus is now to stand in the gap to bridge man back uh, to covenant relationship with God. Covenant relationship is the relationship built on the principles of God that man can walk in harmony with God. Uh, simply put, man walking in harmony with God on God's terms. That's covenant relationship. So when we start uh, trying to determine or direct or dictate the terms of the covenant relationship between us and God, we are no longer in covenant relationship. We may still be in relationship but we're breaking, we're cracking, we're, we're trying to rearrange what uh, covenant is defined as. And covenant is a relationship with God on God's terms, not our terms. So get that one worked down into your spirit. And in Ezekiel uh, chapter 22 and verse 30, And I sought for a man among them, that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me uh, for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. You see, God was saying, if I had someone that would stand in that spot and uh, a man that would intercede for mankind, then uh, I wouldn't destroy it. He sought for somebody, but he didn't find anybody. So it's important that we be in covenant relationship with God and that we be in the right place. Hallelujah. And that we have a listening ear uh, for the for God to speak to us. In Matthew, in the book of Matthew in the New Testament, chapter 23 and verse 29, uh, he said this, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so... Uh, saying that you're going to recognize uh, those. You're going to recognize that when, when Jesus himself, when someone else comes in the name of the Lord, you're going to recognize that they have blessing that they are bringing with them. Hallelujah. There's not just some preachers, not just some uh, woman of God, but it's not just some man that knows scripture but it's somebody that carries a blessing with them. Hallelujah. And so, Second Chronicles, almost everybody knows the first part of this, chapter 7, but we're going to be looking at verse 14 through uh, verse 16. Let's look at that. Uh, 
if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their lands. Most people know that part, but watch what comes after that. Now my eyes shall be open and my days shall uh, attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and, uh, and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart shall be open, shall be there perpetually. I'm sorry. Uh, that my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Humankind's reaction to God, that prideful refusal to turn around in repentance and head back into covenant relationship with God has always been the problem. But in embracing God's uh, will uh, and his ways will create new pathways uh, which God will begin to open. So when we embrace God, when we embrace the will of God, and we uh, walk in the pathways that he lays out before us, it, it's going to open up new areas, new territories for us. The battle that accompanies this uh, repentant return of the believer, once begun in the spirit, must be fought in the spirit. The natural life of the human with the changed heart will follow the leading of the spirit. So uh, it, what we're saying here is that if your lifestyle, if what you're doing in your life is not lining up with a spirit-led life, then you're not walking in the spirit. And, uh, oh, Brother Jim, that's that's hard. That No, it's not hard. That's just, that's just uh, one, two, three, A, B, C. I mean, that's, that's simple stuff. If you're led by the spirit, your life, your actions are going to follow a spiritual line. And so... Look at this. Uh, the natural life of a human with a changed heart will follow the leading of the Spirit. When, when repentance takes hold, we gladly seek after and yield to his voice. Wow. So when repentance takes hold, we're going to follow that, that opening that is made there. We're going to follow in that pathway. Uh, let's look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 through 3 he gives an example here paul is talking to the galatians and he kind of gets on to them here and he says uh galatians 3 and 1 says oh foolish galatians who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes jesus christ had been evidently set forth crucified among you one time you knew who Jesus was, and you followed that, and your life was spiritual is what he was saying. Verse 2 says, uh, This only would I learn of you, receive ye uh, the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Wow, that's, that's pretty stout, isn't it? Pretty stout stuff. So, uh, after and the absolute necessity for humankind is to seek an understanding and alignment with the covenant relationship with God who, without compromise, is obvious. This is the only way to walk with insight and authority with the plan of God to invite others back to a covenant relationship with God. And to find oneself able to develop into the full measure and the stature of a son or daughter of God and one with his warrior souls. Church, in this spiritual warfare, we must come in alignment with God. And we come in alignment by coming uh, back into covenant relationship. Back into that. He said, uh, back, uh, referring back to Second Chronicles 7, 14, he said, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, there's a lot of moving parts in this, isn't it? Uh, I always uh, referred to that where he said, and seek my face 
there were, who does he say is going to see him? Blessed are the who? The pure in heart. Purify your hearts. You want to see God? Uh, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. He, he says, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll, I'll listen to your prayers. I'll heal your land, so forth and so on. So we're looking at a time where we must get back. We must get back into alignment with God. Let's pray a prayer of deliverance. Father, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah. God, we see that uh, our our ancestors, even ourselves in an earlier life, Lord, that we have broken fellowship with you. We've broken covenant and we've walked deceitful and, and without uh, the blessing of heaven over our lives. And But God, here we are living down here in 2023, seeking after a, a, uh, a relationship with you, God, but we've gotten so far away from the mark that so much of the church is trying to do it a different way. They're trying to do it in some kind of designer religion where it's not uncomfortable. It doesn't make us too, uh, have to make too many changes at once. But God, I'm, I'm saying today, God, that we're willing to break the cycle of repeated uh, falling away. We're ready to break the cycle of... Uh, of unrepented lives. And God, we want to come in alignment with you. We want to come in covenant with you. And we want to walk in the cleanness of who you are, God. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you and we love you. And we ask you to accept our prayers. Forgive us, God, as we turn from our wicked ways and we walk back in covenant with you, God. Lord, and that you'd continue to touch our minds as we continue to learn more about you and your ways learn more about spiritual warfare and how to come in alignment with that. We thank you, Lord. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Church, I love you. Thank you for uh, tuning into this. And uh, we're going to continue to do uh, uh, spiritual warfare classes. We have seven more. Uh, get with us on Facebook. Uh, you'll find it under Faith Keepers. And, uh, but also uh, me, Jim Maddox, You'll find me on uh, Facebook. And if you're, uh, we have a web page if you want to go there. And it is stillkeepingthefaith.com. You go to that web page, you can uh, leave us a request. If you're having trouble linking up with us, uh, you can leave me a way to get in touch with you. I'll be glad to do that. We love you. Thank you for tuning into this. Again, like and subscribe to this channel if you would. We love you. And right here in East Texas, I'm still keeping the faith.